Mm. Like for me to, to, to isolate myself so that I can hear God's voice, there's an easy way to do that. Tell yourself, this week I'm not turning the television on. Mm. I'm not turning the radio on. I'm mm. not going to do email. I'm mm. not going to do texting. Mm -hmm. Then you've got time to mm -hmm. spend no, with God. I know why I can't reach you sometimes. <laughs> The world is talking a lot about mindfulness and meditation these days, so as long as we're meditating, it's okay, right? Or is it? Find out on this episode of LED Live. Well, welcome everyone to another episode of LED Live. Today we have a couple of guests again. We have Mike Shreve and Eric Wilson joining us today. Very good to be here. Good to see you Yeah, guys. thank you guys for coming and joining us to talk about meditation. And you guys have both done some meditation in your past, right? Unfortunately, yes. Yeah, <laughs> very and, deeply and I involved. Think you're still doing some meditation today. Yes. Much more. Much but it's a little <laughs> yeah. different, right? Maybe yeah. a lot different. And that's what we're going to talk about. So what, what kind of meditation are we going to start talking about first? Um, well, it's, it's funny because we're going to be looking at Hindu meditation, which Mike is the expert on that since he was a, a guru in yoga for many, many years. Um, and then we're going to also look at the Buddhist and the Taoist forms of meditation. It was funny what you just said about, you know, but you're still meditating today. And I thought about it. And I thought, I used to meditate, you know, three or four, five hours a day when I was in the martial arts. And now I meditate 20 hours a day. I mean, as long as I'm <laughs> awake, I'm walking and I'm thinking and talking to the Lord and thinking about His Word. So, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a huge difference. <clears throat> And uh, that was my entire life at one point when I was a teacher of Kundalini Yoga at four universities back in 1970. And I was running a yoga ashram. We would get up at 3.30 in the morning and I would be in some type of meditative approach until 5.30 that night. Whether wow. it's mantra yoga or raja yoga or kundalini yoga or hatha yoga, all of it is intertwined with meditative techniques. And of course, the Bible also says pray without ceasing. And the only way to achieve that is to have a meditative mindset all day long. But there is a huge difference between what I did as a yoga teacher sure. and what I believe now Amen. as a Christian, as a follower okay. of Jesus. Well, let's Amen. talk about that. I want to um, open today with a, a scripture verse that really caught my attention a number of years ago. This is found in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 29 through 31. And it's speaking to us, all of us. It's like every person in the world, no matter what your beliefs are, God created you personally. He loves each of us personally. He doesn't view one of us as, as better than the other. But he's speaking to each of us through his word personally. And this is what it says. It says, oh, that they were wise and that they only understood this, that they would consider their latter end. For how should one chase a thousand or two put 10,000 to flight, except their rock had sold them and the Lord had shut them up? For their rock is not as our rock. Even our enemies themselves know this. Hmm. And then he goes on in the next verse and he says something that catches my attention. It says, For their vine is the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall or poison and bile, and their clusters are bitter. Their wine, like it talks about in Revelation, the wine of Babylon, is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. And when I read that and I thought about Mike with, with the Chinese and the Japanese, the dragon is seen as being the, the, the figure that gives the most power. That's the most influential figure. In Hinduism, the serpent right. is the most. The kundalini power means serpent power. Right. That's interesting. So you have here in this verse, God is warning us about the venom of the dragon and of the serpent. And an asp is a serpent, for those that's who might not be familiar with the term. That's right. 
Yeah. But you know, in Revelation chapter 12, it says, speaking of Satan, it says the great dragon, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Mm -hmm. So in the in the scriptures, the serpent, instead of being viewed as, as a, a mighty power that is, you know, something to be craved or sought after, it's telling us this is a symbol of Satan, the destroyer. I like how, how it also describes, like, even, even they know that this rock is not as big as, you know, this rock. <laughs> Amen. And I think that's, that's kind of neat. I think really, uh, you know, God is, God is your sure foundation. He is your rock. Amen. And the biblical imagery is not one of the serpent being revered or lifted up. I mean, even from the beginning in the garden, that's right. You know, when God cursed the serpent, it was like, no, you get to crawl on the ground and eat dust all the days of your life. It's about as low as you can go. Yeah. It, but it's the nature of the servant or the serpent to elevate itself, you know. That's a good point. And the whole purpose of meditation, when I was involved in yoga, instantly the word yoga means yoke and its implication mm -hmm. is union with God. The whole purpose was to achieve God consciousness mm -hmm. through these meditative mm -hmm. practices. And for instance, uh, we would spend much of the day in mantra yoga, which is a kind of meditation that we may touch on later, but it was very important to have the correct bodily position mm -hmm. in order to achieve the maximum amount of results. Because supposedly if you sat in the lotus position, mm -hmm which is a cross-legged position where your feet are propped up on mm -hmm. your thighs. Don't ask me to do it now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> when I was a little bit more pliable as a 20-year-old, uh, it was more possible. But uh, And then with your back erect, and, and it's very important, too, for you to have your hands in a certain what's called a mudra, M-U-D-R-A, mm -hmm. because then supposedly the energy flow is like a completed circuit. Mm -hmm. yeah. But this also represents something. The forefinger represents Atman, which is the individual soul, and the thumb represents Brahman, which is what's termed the oversoul, which is an impersonal life force. Not a personal God that you pray to, but an impersonal life force that you meditate on and seek to awaken within yourself until you come to a point of realization. And that self-realization is the realization that you are God yeah. in a certain aspect of Hinduism. Not all Hindus approach it that way, but those who believe in what's called Advaita Vedanta, mm -hmm. which is the belief that the universe is an emanation of God, so everything has a divine essence. So the position is extremely important because this is an invocation yeah. to Brahman to come and fully manifest within the individual meditator. But in the Bible, the position is not relevant at all. Mm -mm. Uh, the first time you find meditation mentioned in the Bible is Genesis 24, verse 63. Okay. And that's when Isaac, who is the son of Abraham, walks out into a field to meditate in the evening. Okay. And so he's just walking through the field. And I think that's similar to the idea expressed in Genesis where Adam walked with God mm -hmm. in the garden. Mm -hmm. And later on it talked about Enoch mm -hmm. walk mm -hmm. with God mm -hmm. and Abraham walk with God. And it's a very at ease, conversant kind of connective relationship because uh, real meditation is not mechanical. Mm -hmm. It's not manipulative. It's not monotone or monotonous or mundane. It's relational. And mm -hmm. all the Eastern approaches to meditation that I was involved in are very mechanical. And it treats God like just a force that you can manipulate with the right incantation. Mm -hmm. and, you know, Mike, it, Forgive me for interrupting, that's what they taught in the Star Wars series. Hmm. The force mm -hmm. was this pantheistic energy that right. you know, was inside of everything. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was the goal, was to connect with that. Mm -hmm. But I, I've often told people that 
would you try to deepen your relationship with your wife or your husband that way? Would you go into a room, sit cross-legged, and close your eyes, and then chant in a monotone way, I love you, honey, I love you, honey, for hours at a time because you're racking up points in a sense. The more you say it, the more uh, benefit supposedly you get. By the time you say that a dozen times, your wife will leave the room and call somebody uh, (laughs) who can get a psychiatrist over to the house right away. My my husband's gone crazy. Uh, And and if we would not approach relationship Mm -hmm. with a fellow human being in that mechanical kind of way, why do we think God is less than that? Yeah. Because God is a person. God Amen. is not a force. God is a person. Amen. And I think that's yeah. very important to see. And the very central theme of the Bible is God is love. I mean, Amen. It, 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 I think it kind of sets apart, like, I'm not too sure if you actually even speak of other gods in that way. Like, man, Some that do. God really loves me. You know, do they do they talk like that in the Eastern no, cultures? Not really in, in that, that way. warmth yeah. that you just expressed that. But some... Far Eastern believers are dualistic, where they believe that God exists as separate from them. He's just one of many. To a degree. They still believe there's a divine essence within them. Mm -hmm. But uh, say Krishna devotees. Mm -hmm. But they still approach meditation from a very mechanical Mm -hmm. standpoint. Mm -hmm. Uh, For instance, uh, in in Krishna, in fact, let me me look this up because I I, want to get the... I want to get the exact figures. While you're doing that, I, I think it's really neat that God doesn't require us to come to him in that way, that there isn't a, well, I just didn't do it good enough. You know what right. I mean? Like like we have the ability to just, just utter a, a, a thought or utter a, Lord, help me, you know? And it's like all of a sudden God can right. you know, manifest in a big way in your life. Amen. It's not that I did those things this way and this way and this way and this so that determined God's help to me, you know? Do you know what's sad? The Jewish religion at the time when Christ came the first time, it had become very much like that. Yeah, mechanical. Very mechanical. Mm -hmm. Um, Not for all of them, Mm -hmm. but for a large percentage of the Jewish people, it had become just a ritual. Yeah. It's like, did you wash your hands? Did you do it three times? Did you take this? Did you do this? Did you bow so many times? And Jesus was like, they have a form but there's no power. They do yeah. not. They don't know me anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and, and it's actually much, much simpler mm-hmm. and much more profound and beautiful when you see the availability of relationship. Amen. But I was mentioning the Krishna mm-hmm. devotees, mm-hmm. and uh, last time I went to Los Angeles, by the way, I was blessed to be able to spend about an hour talking to the head of the Krishna consciousness movement in North America. Are they down there in Venice Beach? Uh, no, they're, they're there was a Hare Krishna. There's like, a temple. There yeah, may there's be a temple one. right there by the beach that I remember. I lived around there when oh. I was down there, and I'd always see them, you know, with the little yeah. clanking things as they'd walk right. down the street. And, and, they, and they sing the Hare Krishna mm-hmm. chant, mm-hmm. uh, which is Hare Krishna, yeah, Hare, Hare Krishna, 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 Krishna Hare mm-hmm. Hare. And that's called the Maha Mantra. Mm. And they're supposed to say that 108 times with each round. In fact, wow. they have beads that they use, mala. To kind beads. of keep track. Yeah, like the Catholic rosary, <laughs> to make sure that they do it 108 times. And they're supposed to do that uh, a total of 16 times a day, which is 1,728 utterances of that prayer. Wow. I bet you there's an app for that. Yeah. <laughs> it just kind of keeps track. Do it for you. Me. Do it can, for I, me. can I throw something <laughs> wow. in? This is so weird because this was later on, but because you brought that up, when I was in the martial arts and in Tai Chi, I, I found something. It was like, in, especially, especially in Tai Chi, you had what was called the long form, which the founder developed in all of the five main styles of Tai Chi. And the long form that he himself had developed always had 108 movements, always. Even though these men oh, were, were completely years apart from one another, right. maybe didn't even know each other, but all of their long form, which is a number of postures that you go through, mm-hmm. had 108 postures. 
Then you had the short form, which was one that he would do or maybe one of his disciples developed to kind of introduce people because the long one was too long, 108 movements. It was always 36 movements. And this was years after I'd made first black belt. And I was like, 108 and 36. And then you talk about the Hindu beads. Well, the Buddhists use the beads. Mm -hmm. The Muslims use the beads. The Roman Catholics use the beads. What's amazing is, is that the perfect string of beads has 108 beads in it. That's interesting. Every one of those beads, and I actually found this from one of their websites, not just the beads, but the 108 postures, the 108 beads represent 108 deities. Hmm. There are 36 deities that are said to be ter uh, terrestrial. In what worldview are you referring to? Uh, Taoist or Taoism. Buddhist. Okay. And then you have 72 beads that are, uh, I'm sorry, 36 are celestial and 72 are terrestrial. So you have heaven is 36 and the earth is 72. Yeah. So when you're doing those beads or you're doing those postures, in the posture, like you said, with the hand position, mm -hmm. it's invoking a deity. Every one of the postures in the ancient forms that were developed by the Taoist and Buddhist, the actual posture was a mudra that you were doing with your body. Well, in, in, in Buddhist meditation, I think it's different. Uh, they have yes. the cosmic hand mudra. Yes. And I think it's like that where they... Some of them do it that, and, yeah. And and from what I was familiar with, that represented the universe and it's because of the whole there yes. that it's empty of any lasting existence or value. Yes. And, which was a basic idea in Buddhism. But it was, it was amazing to me that you are invoking deities. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. Now, all, all of these practices are in stark opposition to Jesus' teaching. Amen. Because in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, he said, use not vain repetitions mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like That's the right. heathen do. Yep. Yep. Why would he say that? Yeah. Use not vain repetitions like the heathen do because they think they'll be heard for their much speaking. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea is that you build up through the repetitions mm -hmm. that you do, some type of uh, reward that can be returned to you, mm -hmm. uh, deliverance from the cycle of rebirths or mm -hmm. something like mm -hmm. that. If you have a certain number of millions of repetitions of a certain phrase, it might be enough to burn up all your karma and release you from the cycle of rebirths. And it's mm -hmm. all a man-achieved goal of mm -hmm. deliverance from this lower state. But uh, again, it's a vain way to approach a relationship with God. You mentioned the serpent in the beginning. The whole goal of meditation within the Hindu framework was the awakening of the kundalini. Mm -hmm. And probably we'll need to get into that in just a minute. Didn't you have a question though or a comment? Before we deviated from the 108, I just, I just want to see if I remember something correctly. So okay. you probably will. In the Shaolin Temple, the Hall of Wooden Dummies. Yes. Aren't there 108? I believe so. Yeah, that they have to pass through before they get I believe their so. arms branded. I believe there were. Yeah, I'll I have to double check. It's been a while. So is it, do you know of any rhyme or reason why 108? Like, is there a... Those are the deities. Oh, okay. Did just like you're explaining, the 36 and the 74. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. So that's why all of them had that 108, is because those are the... And who knows? I don't know this. But what if we were to get to heaven and find out, oh, yeah, well, those were the top generals in the satanic forces. I mean, who knows what that is? Yeah. Satan's got to make them feel like well, you're being elevated because that's what he's been trying to do to everybody since he fell. Yeah. Well, all the postures in yoga, uh, or at least the majority of postures in yoga, actually are dedicated to individual deities. Yes, and I've read that. Yeah, yeah I just looked it up. It yes, is definitely. Is that where well, there were 108 in the mm -hmm. wooden men? Yeah, the yeah. Shaolin 108 uh, wooden men hall. And Paul mentioning, you know, they they sacrificed. They did not know what they were sacrificing to, but they were sacrificing to demons. You know, I'm sure behind um, um, some of these things that other people will, you know, worship and consider. You know. To peel back the onion oh, a go ahead. Bit. I'm sorry, Keith. No, I was just going to get back to my, what Mike was saying. You know, the the vain repetition. It's like 
what a miserable existence. You have to say something over and over again. And, and so contrary to the way God is. It's God's mind like, numbing. I said it once. Yeah. It happens. It's well, done. I don't have to repeat a statement I'm making to you right. a thousand times on this uh, interview or right. this broadcast or whatever you want to call this, this discussion among us, mm -hmm. uh, because you're a thinking, rational human being. Usually, and yes. what? <laughs> yeah, and how much more is God <laughs> right, than, right. than even yeah. us? You know. Yeah. Do you know what's interesting, Mike? When you were saying that, um, there's another there's another potential there. By using vain repetition, it also helps to induce an altered state of consciousness, which is yes, what Satan does. wants. Anyway, it's like when you breathe and you breathe and you breathe in, you breathe out. It enters you into an altered state of consciousness. But do you know? You remember when Elijah went up on Mount Carmel? and the prophets of Baal were trying to call on Baal to get him to answer, it was all day, over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And finally they got to the point where they weren't getting an answer, so they started cutting themselves. And the whole time Elijah's sitting there and he's thinking, these poor men. And you know what he did? He prayed, God answered. Right. Yeah. And so he didn't have to earn it through repetition. Amen. Uh, my heart goes out though, to these committed Buddhist monks who spend Me their too. lives in a monastery from early ages sometimes, their parents yes. take them to the monastery. And, and their whole goal is reaching nirvana. And they go through tremendous self-sacrifice. So the wandering sadhus in India who in like manner spend their whole lives meditating and doing various yogic approaches to try and reach God consciousness. I admire their commitment. I don't agree with their conclusions. Right. But I admire the commitment of anyone who's reaching for something higher than just the mundane existence of living in this world. If they had that kind of commitment to the falls, imagine what they will be sure, like absolutely. when they find Christ. Because mm -hmm. they will be, it was like Paul. He was so dead set against Christ, but when he was one to Christ, he turned the world upside down. Right, right. So, so there's people, hopefully, that will be watching Amen. this program that are involved in these kinds of meditation. And hopefully you will find out that all you have to do is call on the name of Jesus, invite him to be Lord of your life. You can be born again, which is an experience where you receive a new spirit infused with God's spirit. Amen. And then all of a sudden you're aware of the presence of God in your life. It is an experience of awareness, but it's not self-awareness. It's not self-deception in the name of awareness. It's an awareness of the reality of God in your life that comes when you go through the door. Because Jesus meant what he said in John 14, Amen. 6, when he declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. And he also said, all who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. That's right. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a kind of harsh statement when I first read it, when I first became a follower of Jesus. And then I realized, uh, take Buddha for instance. Mm -hmm. I don't believe Buddha was intentionally robbing Jesus, the Messiah, of his position as world teacher. Mm -hmm. I think Buddha felt that his conclusions were correct, mm -hmm. but by virtue of positioning himself in a place of influence and leading others into what he taught was the truth, mm -hmm. then he was robbing Jesus who would come, what, 500 years later of a position that only he had the right to fill mm -hmm. as the teacher mm -hmm. of all mankind. So mm. uh, again, Good point. we need to realize that it's only through Jesus. But I do want to mention and I'm glad you've got that on the screen, uh, the picture of all the chakras. And, and we may get into chakra meditation later on. Uh, but when I would meditate as a follower of Hinduism slash Sikhism, the, the guru I studied under was actually a Sikh who embraced a lot of Hindu concepts, which made some Sikhs doubt his claim to being a leader in Sikhism. But uh, anyway, the whole purpose was to awaken this serpent power mm -hmm. that we referenced a while ago. Well, what is the kundalini? What is the serpent power? Supposedly, according to that teaching, it is a coiled energy dormant at the base of the spine that through meditation 
is aroused and like a striking serpent, it rises up through the seven chakras and then it, in a sense, strikes the crown chakra where Shakti and Shiva, which are two deities, female and male deity, are united and that's when a person achieves God consciousness. Isn't Shiva the goddess of destruction? No, Shiva's the god. The, the god, god of, of destruction. destruction. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The and destroyer. It's a, it's, and it's he's a also male, called, he's not also, a female. Yeah, male. And that's the one where you have the circle and it's many arms. Is that right. Shiva? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the dance of Shiva. Mm -hmm. The dance of Shiva is the, the cycles of the inner universe from manifestation to destruction and the cycle of every human being from birth to death and then rebirth. And he's called the Lord of Yoga. But the reason he is revered is that through death, then you can evolve to the next birth and eventually be delivered from the whole cycle of rebirth. That, yeah, that's and, the way they so, look at it. And they don't realize death is a result of sin. Right. Yeah. We, yeah. Yeah, so, and, but, and I suppose like if time were to go on and on and on, right, in this line of thinking, then all of a sudden there'd be millions and millions of gods. Oh, yeah. Oh, there are Th 330 million gods. That's what they in say. In Hinduism, but each person is a potential god. So these are all people that have achieved this higher state of existence and now... Not all. Uh, I don't know that all the deities in Hinduism would be considered... Like they were uh, once human or something, you know, kind of a yeah, thing. Yeah, I, I don't think that's the case. But, but each individual has that potential mm -hmm. of ultimately achieving that. But, well, in, in Buddhism, you're more familiar with that. The whole goal is to become a Buddha yourself, right? Yeah. And, and what Buddha did was he became connected to the universe. He became one with the universe. And mm -hmm. uh, so that's the whole goal. Or at least that's what his claim was. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, is that goal of being one with the universe means you become one with God because the God they worship is a pantheistic God. So when you become one with this force, this energy that they call God, you become God. Mm -hmm. And we've got quotes later on. I'll get in, into that. But this, uh, this talk is supposed to be about meditation. Mm. So uh, I thought it would be good if we went over the eight kinds of meditation that you find in Eastern religions be it Taoism or uh, Hinduism or Buddhism. Number one is breath meditation. Number two is yantra meditation. Number three is chakra meditation. Number four is mantra meditation. Number and that's funny because a lot of people will say, oh, that's my mantra, and they don't even realize what they're saying <laughs> is not a good thing. Can, can you give me a little breakdown of what what, what does it mean to be have breath meditation? Well, I thought we'd do that uh, sure. after I mentioned the whole list, then sure. we could go back and and pick each one out and go deeper into it. Number five is sound meditation. Hmm. Number six is movement meditation, which you'll be much more familiar with. Uh, number seven is visualization meditation. Hmm. And number eight is silent meditation. Hmm. Hmm. And breath meditation is called the entry level yeah. of meditation. It's the simplest to do. And so uh, they teach that anyone can do it. And, and this is the, the deception of it that if you were to do that, if you were just somebody with a lot of chaos in your life and you're wanting to calm your mind and you're stressed to the max and you read some little booklet that says all you've got to do is sit down, close your eyes and concentrate on exhaling and inhaling, that's going to give you a semblance of peace. Hmm. Well, the, I've often heard of that in terms of if you can't sleep at night, if you actually be conscious of your breath in and out, you can actually put you to sleep. That's how I've heard it. Mm -hmm. But uh, is that it, kind it, of the same thing? Well, like it's, that's like it's a, similar. Okay. It, it's it's the practice of mindfulness uh, yes. from Buddhism, and then uh, there there are a lot of related concepts in all the different religions. But supposedly by concentrating on the inflow and outflow of breath, then you're, you're becoming more conscious of the source of life. Mm -hmm. and, and you're reducing what they call monkey chatter yes. in your mind, where you're getting your mind off of all these issues and events and pressures and demands in your life, and you're just getting focused 
on your breath. Now, people think, hey, this is working because they feel what seems to be peace. After I would chant, and we'll get to that more in just a minute, hopefully, but after I would chant for an hour or two hours, I would come out of it and I would be like buzzed. I, I'd yeah. feel this hmm. energy level where I thought, hey, I'm really connecting with this force, this power, mm -hmm. this Brahman mm -hmm. uh, deity in Hinduism because I felt energized by it. Well, first of all, it, hyperventilation is going to make right. you feel energized. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and in Kundalini Yoga, they had something called the breath of fire. Mm. where you would actually inhale and exhale very fast mm -hmm. for a certain amount of times, and then you would hold your breath, mm. and it would like zzz, send this energy flow through. Well, that's just, that's going to happen to anybody right, right, right. that breathes heavy. But mm -hmm. what the mistake they make is that in Hinduism, and maybe you can give me the, the Buddhist term, they call it prana. Mm -hmm. Everything is saturated with prana. Prana is the elemental life form uh, and prana exists in the air as well as in thought life, in intangible things and in any material things and living things especially you find prana. So when you're doing a breathing meditation, you're actually intensifying your level of prana. And to them, that's synonymous with coming into oneness with God. Hmm. Be because to them, that's inseparable. The life that's in every creature, mm -hmm. the life that's in every plant, the life that's in every human being is, in that worldview, the life of God. You just have to learn how to tap into it. Like in, yeah. in the, the Buddhist and in the Taoist, they actually break that thing that the Hindus call prana, they break it into three separate uh, parts. So you have chi, and then you have shin, which is spirit in mind. And then you have something called jing, which is chi or prana, except it's formed into like a chemical essence that's in every living thing. Hmm. So, but the thing that, that is scary about it is, is that people will say, like you just repeated, um, it works. Well, yeah, but what are you opening the door to? You know, if I'm not sleeping well at night, I turn to Psalms and I, I claim God's promise. I will lay, you will lay me down to sleep and I will rest tonight in peace. He gives his beloved sleep. I believe, I yeah. believe his promises. Yeah. And I ask the Lord, Lord, take my thoughts captive to Christ. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says that let this mind be in each of us that was in Christ Jesus. So by claiming his promise, God who is in his word, his spirit is in his word, comes into me. Mm -hmm. And it does what his word says. Mm -hmm. By the same token, Satan knows the rules to that game. Mm -hmm. So if the, if the Hindus or the Buddhists or the Taoists say, no, do this, breathe this many times and say this, and I yield myself and obey, that opens the door for his spirits to come in and do his work. Well, that's what life. happened when I meditated on the Kundalini. And when I would feel this power rising up through me, and one time I went into white light, mm -hmm. and a couple of times I had astral projection experiences yeah. of what appeared to be, what seemed to be. I have a different interpretation of it now. Amen. Actually, what happened to me, and it did not become apparent to me until after I was born again, is I became demon-possessed. Yes. Mm. And these demons impersonating this kundalini power possessed me and were very obliging in giving me supernatural experiences to make me think I'm achieving my goal. I know. I'm getting there. I'm arriving. And it just opens the door to all kinds of mental and, and emotional problems. In fact, the gurus warn you that if you prematurely awaken the kundalini, you could go crazy, you could go insane, you could awaken dark occultic powers, you could have yes. visions of demons. <clears throat> And so they warn you that this could be a very negative experience, but there has never been a case in the Bible where someone had a real encounter with the true God, and, when and it was detrimental. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Very true. So, it, it just, he very, heals and, you and, of that. Yeah, and in fact, the opposite is almost the truth because... 
those dem demoniacs, when they came to Jesus, they were flailing all around and madmen, basically. And the second they, they had Christ in their lives and, you know, opened their hearts to him, it was peace and calm and this Amen. and that. So, so, yeah, the kundalini thing is just kind of a lot of the opposite type. It's like this more energy and more, you know, things that could be chaotic in your life rather than you get this peace. So Keith, wanna, but wanna, it's not the something. peace of God in, in yeah. yoga and meditation. It's not the peace of God. Yeah. It's a, a soulish kind of peace. Mm. It can be a demonic counterfeit of peace. Mm -hmm. But when you experience the Prince of Peace, yeah, that's right. which is one of Jesus' yeah. names, he's Sar Shalom. He's the Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. And he fills you with his peace, mm -hmm. not just a peace that comes from God. He said, not as the world gives, mm -hmm. give I unto you, but my peace I give unto Amen. you. That's an indescribable peace. Right. Mm -hmm. It's peace that passes understanding mm -hmm. far greater mm -hmm. than I ever got mm -hmm. by sitting cross-legged and chanting a mantra mm -hmm. for an hour. Mm -hmm. so Amen. True. So true. Amen. So I want to so, kind of bring this to a, a practical level for our viewing audience because maybe they've never been involved in yoga or the martial arts or whatever. You guys are probably familiar with this app called Calm. Yeah, I've, heard I've seen of it. it I've heard of it. You've seen it advertised. I've even seen um, they have products in mainstream stores like Walmart or Target or something, right? So they bill themselves as, if you just Google Calm, um, the number one app for meditation and sleep, okay? And you go to their website and, you know, it's like find your calm. Our goal is to help you improve your health and happiness. What can we help you with today? improve sleep quality, reduce stress or anxiety, improve focus, self-improvement, or something else. And you kind of select that, and it, it guides you, you know, on what, what you need to start doing. So you go to the help center. It's like, well, well what, what is this really? Like, what, what are we doing? Because this is focused on breathing. That's what this app is doing, is helping you focus on the way you're breathing and, and relaxing and, and all of this kind of stuff. And they, you look on their, their, this is from their website, what, meditate, what meditation techniques does Calm use? Because you could have somebody out there, they, they pick this up at the store, or they, they're scrolling through on their phone, they download it, yeah, I want to sleep better at night, I want to be more relaxed, you know. They're not going down to the local yoga, you know, training center or whatever, they're just like, oh yeah, I'm going to use an app, what, what can help me do? So you look on their website and it says this, and, and I want you guys to jump in on this. It says, some of our sessions include, introduce specific practices, okay? Now, before I read the rest of the sentence, I'm going to read the last sentence. All of our teachings are universal and non-religious, okay? That's what they say. They're universal and non-religious. Now I'm going to finish. Some of our sessions in, introduce specific practices that lie within the umbrella of mindfulness, such as vipassana or insight practice and loving kindness okay it means to see things as they really are so i That's just looked what it the up. meaning of it is okay and it says special super scene it's a buddhist term that is often translated as insight and uh then it mentions some guy Pali canon describes it as or maybe a, a, a holy book describes it as one of two qualities of mind which is developed in buddhist meditation the other being samantha so, they said how it can would, it be non-religious? And yet right. incorporate if it's coming from a religion. That's a marketing scheme, right? It's a marketing scheme. So, you know, you can pick something up at the store and think, no big deal. You know, I'm just doing this to relax, and then all of a sudden you're be kind of being slowly. It's like, like you just said, the breathing is the introductory experience. And, it's the initiation. And here is the basis of the deception. Breath is synonymous with life force mm -hmm. within the New Age or Far Eastern framework of thinking. But our natural breath is totally different than the breath of God Amen. in Christianity. Mm -hmm. And that's where you have two kinds of life. In fact, the Bible uses two different Greek words. Uh, for instance, Jesus said, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat and what you shall drink. That's the word suke, P-S-U-C-H-E. Suke. But then when he said, he who believes on me has everlasting life, mm -hmm. it's a different word. Mm -hmm. 
It's the word zoe, Z-O-E, which means divine life, mm -hmm. God life, resurrection life. Mm -hmm. And so there's a difference between the two, and, and, and that's really important to see because uh, even some Christians don't understand that when they do breath meditation, they think they're breathing in the presence of God. I, I've met some people that did Christian yoga, talked with them, and they thought that breathing like that was an intensification of a realization that they're breathing in the presence of God, but it's oxygen and nitrogen Amen. and other gaseous vapors. And I have a favorite acrostic for yoga, Y-O-G-A, you only get air. You can't, <laughs> you can't breathe your way into a relationship with God. Sure. In the upper room after Jesus rose from the dead, the Bible said he breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit, Amen. implying that the breath that he just breathed was something they didn't have yet. Amen. And it was a restoration of what Adam lost in the beginning because God breathed into this clay form that he had just created and Adam became a living soul. So what happened when he fell? He was still a soul, but he was a dead soul subject to all kinds of death-dealing attitudes like depression and hatred and jealousy and, and anger and things mm. like that and lust. The soul died, the breath of God took its uh, flight or departed from Adam and it was only restored after Jesus paid the price on the mm. cross. Amen. And so that needs to be emphasized mm. that the breath of a human being is not divine in essence. And I want to bring out the fact that some popular Christian songs that I love, I sing these songs and it moves my heart, and yet they've got lines in them that are Far Eastern mm. in their interpretation, like Reckless Love. I'm sure mm -hmm. you've heard Reckless Love. Mm -hmm. I'm not slamming the guy mm -hmm. that wrote the song. I mm -hmm. think he really loves God. Mm -hmm. But he said, before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. Mm. You have been so, so kind to me. Mm -hmm. Well, wait a second, that's not true. Right. Uh, the mm. breath of God didn't come into me until the day I was saved and mm -hmm. born again. Mm -hmm. And that's when God revitalized my Amen. soul mm -hmm. with the entrance of his spirit into my life. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen prior to birth. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of other songs like, uh, you ever have you ever sung, Great are you, Lord, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. Hmm. That's not true. Hmm. God's breath is not confined to my lungs. Hmm. It saturates and permeates my spirit Good and point. my soul. So I believe that's something... Uh, yeah, that's interesting. We've only gotten to meditation process number one, yeah, which you, is breath meditation. Yeah, so we can move on quickly, but you start to see how some of these influences have actually, you know, found its way into all kinds of different pieces yes. of life. Not knowing where, you know, the basis of these Eastern ideas are coming from and not understanding them, you would hear a song like that, and I didn't really even put that two things together, you know. Right. But now that I understand with you guys explaining to me where this is basically going, now I can see that there actually is. Oh, yeah. That and is, the that writers is probably didn't intend anything right, wrong right, by it. It right. just sounds poetically nice right. to say it that right, way. Right, right, right. Uh, well, shall we move on to number two? Yant <laughs> you, yantra? Lead. you lead. <laughs> uh, yantra meditation uh, is meditating on a geometric design. And, yeah. and the whole purpose in any of these meditation processes is to empty the mind, mm. which is contrary to the biblical approach. And mm -hmm. of course, we'll cover that later. But staring at a geometric design like a yantra has a hypnotic effect. Mm -hmm. And usually there's something called a bindu, which is a little point right in the middle of the yantra that represents a specific deity like Shiva or, mm -hmm. or um, Vishnu or some other deity. And so you're trying to connect with that deity by focusing on that point until you just block out everything else. It's mm. like a portal mm -hmm. into a mystical experience. Mm. But again, what are you opening your heart and mind up to when you do that? Yeah. Do you know what's interesting? Um, 
a lot of people probably don't even realize that they're doing it, but a lot of books, you'll see it'll have an O and it has a dot in the center of every O on the cover of the book. That, that's like what we see at the Washington Monument. You've got, if you look down at it, you have a circle with a dot in the center. In Taoism, the yin and yang symbol, it originally was a circle. And you see that with the Ouroboros, you know, the serpent mm -hmm. you know, right. swallowing its tail. its tail. But it was originally an Ouroboros. And then they say that that split into two. And when it split into two, it was a circle with the dot in the center. And then they say that formed or transformed and became the yin and yang to where you had dualistic, mm -hmm. light and darkness. Mm -hmm. And now they're saying we're at the point where everything's going to come back to one. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to bring everyone back to one. Well, that's what one. all these processes, mechanical processes, are all about. And, and that's something I like to emphasize over and over again, that if meditation techniques are mechanical, mindless, monotonous, monotone, manipulative, mundane, magical, or even overly mystical, they're probably not the right approach. Amen. Mm. Because again, uh, with regard to the yantra, Y-A-N-T-R-A, would you uh, have a geometric design representing your wife or your husband with a little dot in the middle and try to deepen your relationship with that person by staring at this dot for hours at a time. And she's sitting here trying to get right. your attention, yeah, and you're like, leave me, me alone, leave me alone. Just talk to me, honey. I'm becoming one with you, hon. <laughs> you, you know what's interesting about this is I'm listening to you guys talk. Like, I, I can see these kind of connections to Christianity or to God. Like, like, God asked us to place our eyes upon the cross. Amen. Right? And it's like here, that cross means something to us. When we look at it, we understand what God putting himself on that cross means to us. And it has a transforming power. But here it's like, look at a pattern. Right. Look at an empty pattern that really, for the lack of whatever, doesn't really mean anything to anybody. And it's like, it's like, it's like almost taking that and it's just a counterfeit of what God's really wanting us to do. And it's sad. Mm -hmm. It's very sad that people devote themselves so intensely to a process like that, and it's all in vain. Mm -hmm. It's all in vain. You know, if you can, Mike, while you're on the, the yantras, yes. um, recently, and I don't know when it first started, but recently, in the past couple of years, you can go into bookstores everywhere, and you'll find yantra coloring books mm -hmm. made, right. for, made for adults. That's right. Mm -hmm. But they're Hindu. If you look at the sources, where they're coming from, mm -hmm. and people go, oh, it's for stress. They'll tell you on the book, this is for stress. You just color this. But it is those patterns that is to enter you, help you enter into an altered state of consciousness. And that would sound ridiculous to some people. Mm -hmm. yeah. But each one of those yantras represents an individual deity. That's uh, right. A fallen yeah. angel. Yeah. Uh, or just a creation of someone's imagination. Because yeah. mm -hmm. where did all these deities come from? Why embrace a belief in some deity and you don't even know the source of its existence? Amen. You don't know who uh, brought the myth forth and began to uh, proclaim the existence of this deity, uh, but you just blindly accept it. I know. There was a certain point in my life where I decided, and it was both good and bad, but when I had a near-death experience at the age of 18, I decided, you know, I'm going to seek for God until I find him, but I'm going to wipe the slate clean. Hmm. And any kind of religious influence I've had all my upbringing, I'm not going to be biased in any way. I'm just going to open myself up to everything. And of course, I got sidetracked <laughs> in wrong ways and bad ways. Uh, shall we go to chakra meditation? Yes. Number three, chakra meditation. Um, there are seven chakras, uh, according to Hindus, but then Buddhists teach four chakras, or some Buddhists teach yeah, four chakras. Yeah, but they, they also, it's weird because they've incorporated so much. So like when I was taught it, we were taught all seven. Oh, really? Yes. Well, see, Buddha came up in a Hindu culture, and Buddhism was actually a reform movement within That's right. Hinduism. That's right. Where uh, he rejected the Hindu deities, and some Buddhists, uh, groups now also practice idolatry and and yes. and uh, 
worship of those idols, which Buddha himself would have been strongly against. Well, at the Shaolin Temple, which I know uh, Keith is familiar with, they had something called the uh, Hall of the Mahavari, mm -hmm. and there were three huge Buddhist idols that were in there. And there, it was all idolatry. That was mm -hmm. common. So, so wait a minute, Buddha was against idolatry? He was against the whole pantheon of Hindu gods, and he was against the caste system. He was not of the Brahmin caste, and his family was of the uh, the warrior caste, and and so he felt that was an incorrect view of the way society should be. Mm -hmm. So he started as a so did Guru Nanak, the founder of Sikhism. He was born into a Hindu, predominantly Hindu culture, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and started out as a reform movement within Hinduism. Of course, Sikhs would say, no, he got a revelation. Mm -hmm. It wasn't reforming Hinduism, it was something altogether different. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, so we can uh, meditate on those individual chakras if we're a yoga devotee, and supposedly you can align your chakras. Mm -hmm. Now, chakras have never been proven they, there is no scientific uh, process to prove their existence. The guru I studied under used to say that chakras were imaginary and nothing else. It was just an aid to meditation. So if a proponent of chakra meditation said it was just imaginary, why would anyone actually believe in them, right? And uh, you can see by this uh, image that each one of the chakras represents a different uh, characteristic, mm -hmm. like the heart chakra in the middle of the chest is for love or healing, and then uh, the throat chakra is for communication, etc. And, and when you meditate on those particular chakras, those uh, qualities can be enhanced in your life, supposedly. Well, who wouldn't want more wisdom? Who wouldn't want more awareness? Who wouldn't want more spirituality? The crown chakra is spirituality. Mm -hmm. and, and so you get sucked into this, but meditating on a swirling ball of energy is not gonna make you a more loving person. Right. Mm -hmm. Connecting with the God who is love. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. quoted that scripture a while ago mm -hmm. that God is love and he who dwells in love dwells in God. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to infuse your spirit with love. Mm -hmm. In fact, Jesus prayed that. He mm -hmm. said, Father, the glory you've given me, I have given them. Mm -hmm. The words you've given me, I have Amen. given them. That the love with which you have loved me may be in them. Amen. So he, he actually prayed that we would receive this infilling mm -hmm. of love. Mm -hmm. And that's one amazing thing about becoming a Christian and a follower of Jesus and having a true born again experience, I've seen very hateful people mm -hmm. become very Amen. loving mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. totally. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so again, this is too mechanical. Mm -hmm. It's too monotonous, mundane, mystical, magical. And, and, and it's, to be honest with you, I think it's ridiculous to meditate on some supposed swirling ball of energy that maybe happens to be turning the wrong way and you've got to adjust it through meditation where it will spin the right direction and then ah, I have more peace, I have more love. No, that's like entering some kind of formula into a computer program. I see it a bit like a Ouija board. Like scientifically that Ouija board is literally made up of, of whatever the plastic game pieces are. There's really no scientific explanation of why it does what it does. But you playing with it gives the demonic realm the ability to manifest itself through that game. That's a great but, point. So mm -hmm. this is kind of like how I see that is it's like you're giving a visual cue to, okay, I'm, I'm believing in you guys and I'm giving you license to come and, you know, Absolutely. manifest. Let me interject something because when you were talking about the seven chakras, um, it was interesting because in the Taoist and Shaolin has a blend of Taoism and Buddhism now. Um, even with the t within the past hundred years, the, there's been a... And the Shaolin Temple is where all your martial arts right, came from. Right, right. Um, in the Shaolin, when you, would, when you would concentrate and you would meditate, and this is primarily the Taoist way of looking at it, they say that within the human body, there are two primary channels for this universal energy that they call qi. 
One is called the governing vessel, which starts at a point called the, the perineum, which is down between the anus and the you know, reproductive organs. It starts there and it travels up the spine until it reaches the crown chakra and then it comes down the nose and at a point right here at an angle behind the upper teeth. That's the, what they call the governing vessel. That's what's represented by yang, the male. From there, the tip of the tongue, you have the conception vessel, which is said to travel down the front of the body and meet at the perineum. So within, whenever we were breathing, you would visualize, you were told by your instructor to visualize the energy traveling up the governing vessel on breath in and then breath out, and it would travel down the conception vessel or in reverse, because you would do reverse breathing sometimes. But the whole point there was to get this energy flow going through the body. And then once you got that moving, you were told to begin opening those chakras, like doorways. And like it was funny because you said that in the Hinduism and the yoga, it was a spinning spear or a ball. Think about what is out there in outer space. It's a spinning ball. Mm -hmm. Every one of the planets. There's seven primary chakras. Originally, the ancient pagans, they worshiped seven celestial bodies. Wow. Seven primary. The sun was the male. The moon was the female. And then you had Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn. Hmm. That's shocking because... When I first saw that, it started dawning on me. Everything that they worshipped was gods. Hmm. Those chakras were these planetary gods that the but Romans... Don't the names of the planets come from deities? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the, the Greeks had them. The Romans had them. Mars the Egyptians the god of had war. Them. Mm -hmm. That's right. Jupiter, one of the chief gods. Mm -hmm. Venus, the goddess of love. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, passion. It was, it was immorality, illicit well, yeah, not sex. Real love. Yeah, not, not real love. love. But it, you know, when you said that, I was like, mm -hmm. you know, it all comes back to idolatry. Mm -hmm. Everything that they were doing was idolatry. And what did they experience when they leave their body in meditation? What did I experience the few times that happened to me? Uh, I believe, and I may be wrong on this because it's theoretical and there's nothing to absolutely prove it. But there is some indication in Scripture of what it might be. Because we are told there's a third heaven, which is paradise, where God dwells. Where Paul, yeah, and, Paul and talked that, about it. He, went, he was taken up into the right, third heaven. So there's three heavens. I personally believe that the first heaven is the atmosphere around the earth. And, and the physical cosmos beyond. So it's the physical heaven. I believe, of course, in a third heaven and hope to one day uh, experience it to the fullest. Amen. But what's this second heaven? And it dawned on me that Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. Mm -hmm. He does not rule in hell like almost all your Christian plays right. depict. Mm -hmm. He's not on a throne in hell sending out demons from there. Mm -hmm. He's the prince of the power of the air. Well, you don't see him jumping from one cloud to the next. Mm -hmm. There must be a concentric realm that is just like we can't see infrared or ultraviolet light, mm -hmm. and yet it's part of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. There must be another heaven, a second heaven beyond the first heaven, where there's satanic activity, demonic mm -hmm. activity, mm -hmm. and even angelic clashes with mm -hmm. demons. Yeah, they're roaming back and forth, but we can't right. see that roaming. Right. Yeah. And so when these gurus and swamis and yoga devotees and different individuals and martial arts practitioners do their meditation, they claim to have genuine, authentic, supernatural experiences. What's happening? Mm -hmm. They're penetrating possibly mm -hmm. the second heaven where demonic deception is inevitable. Mm. They cannot get to God. They mm. cannot get Amen. to the third heaven because the only door that leads to a relationship with God is Jesus. Amen. And, and the difference, the huge difference is all these meditative practices are men's attempt to reach ultimate reality 
but Jesus was God's attempt to reach us. Wow. And so it's not reaching up to attain a level of consciousness. Right. It's God coming down to your level right. and fixing the problem. Right. So uh, that, that is interesting because in the occult world, especially in like um, you know the esoteric things like the Kabbalah, they right. often talk about these different realms that when they cross over each other that you can have access in between that realm and that realm can now have access to you and you know, it's kind of interesting just listening to that. And and, and a lot of demonic deception is yeah. involved in all of that. Yes. But, but I wonder what has perpetuated the idea that you can have these out-of-body experiences. And it's because it's a counterfeit experience mm -hmm. of something God has been known to do. He did, mm -hmm. in, apparently in Paul's life or whoever Paul was talking about. But it's counterfeit. Mm -hmm. And counterfeit can only be a reproduction, a false reproduction of mm -hmm. something that is true mm -hmm. and the peace that you feel in meditation is a counterfeit peace compared Amen. to the peace of god Amen. Amen. but what about mantra meditation mantra meditation is as we've already covered the repetition of a certain statement like om let me take om for instance om is actually stretched out into three sounds a u m and each one of those sounds represents a different deity, hmm. which is uh, unknown to a lot of people that chant the word Om. But I believe A is representative of, uh, let's see, I think A was uh, Brahma, the creator god. The U is Vishnu, the preserver god. And the M is Shiva, the destroyer, the destroyer god. Hmm. And so when you chant Om, once again, like you said, it's actually an invocation to these gods to come and supernaturally manifest, take you over and manifest within you. you know, it's, weird. it's an invitation for demons to... The Lord actually told us in the Old Testament, I believe it was in Deuteronomy, he said, don't take the names of these gods upon your lips. Mm -hmm. Like when we're, when we're discussing it, that's different because we're exposing the darkness like we're supposed to. But he's saying... Don't say these names because they'll come. Mm. Right. Mm. You know, if I've got a, a record album stuck away and I go, oh, I don't listen to that anymore, but I don't want to get rid of it because it means a lot to me, of ACDC, well, they go, I've got a right to be there. Mm -hmm. If I'm chanting the names of these gods, they will show up. Mm -hmm. mm. You've invited them. And uh, again, it is a way of numbing the mind. Because when I would chant, the main chant I would chant, and I, I don't really like repeating it for the yes. reasons you just mentioned, but for the sake of this program, I would chant Ek Onkar Sat Nam Siri Wa Guru. And if you were to translate that into understandable English, it would probably say something like, there is one God, truth is his name, and the great spirit is our teacher. Mm. Which is all true. Right, that sounds good. Within <laughs> a biblical framework That's right. of interpretation. That's right, yeah. But when a Hindu says there is one God, it's all inclusive. Mm. That's all interpretations yeah. of the nature of God mm. are, are useful and helpful and they're all correct. Mm. But when a Christian says there is only one God, we're talking about one interpretation of the nature of God, the triune mm. nature of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and these three are one God. Mm -hmm. So that's how close you can get to the truth mm -hmm. and still be yeah. in the darkness of deception. Yeah. You know, the devil likes to do that too because you'll be right on the path and he'll just veer you off just one step. And you're. this is light. Everything else, even if it's one inch or if it's 10 feet off that path, is darkness. Yeah, because if you think of it like um, we've used this illustration before of two ships, you know, and you turn a ship ever so slightly. I mean, it could be a degree, half a degree, quarter of a degree over the course of time, that ship's going to end up way over here. Amen. But in the beginning, it doesn't seem like it's at least it's just one going little in the wrong variation. direction. Mm -hmm. It's just the focus is slightly off shifted. And the last phrase meant the great spirit is our teacher. Mm -hmm. The middle phrase, Satnam means truth is his name, which is a favorite way of referring to God in Sikhism. I mean, even that, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's like, you it know. It is his name. Yeah. But what are you saying truth is? <laughs> right, right. And of course, a Sikh 
uh, recognizes different things as being the truth right. than a Christian. We right. we recognize the need for putting your faith in the crucifixion mm -hmm. of the Lord Jesus where he became sin for us. That's mm -hmm. not in the Sikh worldview mm -hmm. at all. And yet that's fundamentally important in the Christian worldview. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, that three days later he rose from the dead. Mm. Amen. So again, you can even say truth is his name. Well, that's Really a title, that's not a name anyway. So what would you say? We know his personal name as Jesus or Yeshua, the Hebrew form of it. What would you say to a Christian martial artist or somebody that wanted to get involved in this and said, well, I'm saying these names and I'm thinking of this God? Uh, I would say to a Christian, don't ever be in the room where people are chanting the word Om. I've had Christians tell me, well, when I go to yoga class and they yeah, start chanting I just think Om, of the real God. I just think of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's like sitting in an idol temple while idol worship is going on. Good point. And you just close your eyes and think of the true God. That's a good point. Is God going to be happy with that? No. We do find a place in the Old Testament where they tried to put the Ark of the Covenant in the temple of a Philistine God named Dagon. Yeah, amen. <laughs> which was half fish and half man. And they came back the next day, and their God had fallen on his face. Dagon was Wouldn't eating be, dirt. Wouldn't Amen. Wouldn't it be sad if you had to pick your God up because he'd fallen? You know, it's funny because in, in Deuteronomy 18, you know, like the question you asked, mm -hmm. he actually says, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Mm -hmm. Don't learn the ways of the heathen, he says in Jeremiah right, chapter right. 10. So people can say, well, yeah, but I'm worshiping God this way. That happened with Jeroboam. And he said in that same passage, but you shall be perfect with the Lord your Amen. God. Amen. And part of achieving Christian perfection is extricating yourself from all of these non-biblical approaches. Amen. Yeah. Because God lists things in there like witchcraft and, and contacting the dead, necromancy and Amen. things like that. And he said, do not involve yourself in these practices. I, I think it even says in there, don't even observe them doing that. Not yeah. even that you're engaging in it or you're in, you know, whatever. Don't watch them and their worship ceremonies, you know? Right, yeah. Uh, because there, there's... You'll be ensnared. Yeah, if, if you're not really strong spiritually, you can be contaminated. Mm -hmm. Like they had that uh, ceremony of the opening of the uh, tunnel mm -hmm. over in Switzerland. Over in Swi yes, where, I saw that. Yeah, that was like a full blown Luciferian worship. I watched service. just a few minutes of it, and, and I was I, like, "I got to cut this off." This is recently. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. claim, within the past couple of years, I claim the protection of the blood of Jesus. I mean, well, I, no, I mean there I, was like I, world leaders that showed up oh, over yeah, there. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. the yeah. head of is, Germany, the head of Switzerland, <clears throat> the head of. Uh, I mean, it's like the you know the CERN thing with the big Shiva out front of the CERN, and it's like, what, what are yeah. you doing? I know what is like, that? You know, uh, but that's that's oh, yeah, a, totally different another topic, program but. altogether. <laughs> But let, let's, I'll tell you what, I think we've covered chakra meditation and mantra meditation because I've already mentioned what Jesus said, use right. not vain repetitions like the heathen do, and the absurdity of trying to reach God who is a person uh, on a mechanical level like that. Mm. But there's also something, number five, called sh sound meditation, mm. which I participated in when I was in Kundalini Yoga. Is it the donging of things? The gong, and, mm -hmm, the yeah. Gong. Uh, Yogi Bhajan would pull this big mallet out and he had a great big gong about this size and you'd lay flat on your back and just meditate on the third eye and he'd hit that gong over and over and the echo of it, the resounding echo of it. would resonate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it's like vibrational this, energy. This feeling yeah. of something infinite. Yeah. And it kind of helped you transcend into thoughts that were kind of, more infinitely attached than temporally attached mm. and, and get out of a temporal state of mind into an infinite state of mind. But did it really help you reach God? Absolutely mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. But sound meditation is supposed to help that. God does use sound though. Mm -hmm. Like uh, music yeah. is full yeah. of sound. Yeah, he's the uh, creator of the different, music. Uh, different notes, different lyrics can either be containers of demonic influence, mm -hmm. like Amen. the rapper that just came out with Satan's shoes. Mm, right. I guarantee you, you <laughs> listen to his rap music and you're gonna get demonically infested right. if you open your heart to it. Right. Uh, but there's Christian music 
that is truly full of the Holy Spirit. And so sound does have power, mm -hmm. but not in a mystical, mechanical, manipulative, magical way. Mm -hmm. It's just something that fills heaven. Mm -hmm. There's singing and worship and music instruments in mm -hmm. heaven. So why wouldn't God use them on earth, right? And, and you know, God is God is always like, come, let us reason together. Like, right? Like, like let's let me fill your heart and let me come into you, right? It's just very like into like opening of your mind or your heart to God. But when I see the devil's counterfeits for that, it's always dealing with the senses. Yes. It's always like this feeling or this thing that it's like, you know, when that senses gets aroused, then it's like you're, you're, you're achieving God. I don't see God operating like that. Do you know in the Shaolin temple, um, they did the same thing where they would use a gong mm -hmm. uh, during parts of the meditation and the gong and, and they would describe it in different ways. They would talk about um, the vibrational energy, the resonance of the frequency. A lot of people that get involved, um, which I like essential oils, but it's an oil. It's an oil. Yeah. But a lot of the companies will say, no, 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 no. This thing resonates at such a certain frequency. When you put it on your body, it helps to raise your frequency. Hmm. Um, right now on the Internet, there's all kinds of things on YouTube that will say, You'll find it. This is a high frequency that you get to listen to for two hours that is supposed to help you spiritually get closer to God. And they're new age websites, mm -hmm. but they're saying through sound, we can connect you to God. Mm -hmm. So it's using the flesh to connect to God rather than using the heart and the mind. Good point. It's like the difference between Ishmael and Isaac. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Isaac well, was by promise. Ishmael was by flesh. Right. Mm -hmm. All of these are Ishmael efforts at at achieving oneness with God. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be one with God, mm -hmm. but the method you use is absolutely essential. The method you use also determines which God you become one right. with. Because yeah, like if that. I use Satan's method, I'm going to be joined to Brahman or Vishnu or whatever. And you may not know it's the poison of asps. That's right. Like you mentioned at the beginning. You may That's think right. this is a wonderful heavenly nectar, but it's not. Well, the next one is movement meditation. And that's not something I'm familiar with because I, I, I always sat motionless. Uh, when I did meditation in yoga, uh, I have grown to appreciate the passion of Sufis. I don't agree with their worldview or what they teach or their methods, but they're known as, they're a strange kind of new age sect of the Islamic faith. Yes. Mm -hmm and they're more universal in their mindset. They're not exclusive like other Muslims are, but they have this whirling dance. Have you ever seen the yes. whirling dervishes? Or the, and they wear these long white robes and they'll dance with one hand lifted up, at least one, sometimes two, <clears throat> toward the beloved. They refer to God as the beloved. And I think they are genuine lovers of God. Mm -hmm. If you ever read their love poems toward God, it's just uh, amazing the heart they have for God. And it just takes me back to the fact that before I found God by opening my heart to Jesus, I loved God intensely. And there's a huge difference between loving God and knowing God. Mm -hmm. You can love God from a distance and yet that barrier is still there. Mm -hmm. That cannot be bridged unless you use God's approach, mm -hmm. his God-given approach. That's probably why he told them in the Old Testament if they made an altar, not to make it with stones that yeah, were no shaped. Hewitt. Yeah, no it was Hewitt. shaped by man because that represented a man-shaped yeah. approach yeah. to God. Yeah, because he knew in his providence that we would make them bigger and better and yeah. more fancy, and then we'd yeah. outline it with gold and, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he yeah. Just, he just wanted too much of us into stones. it. Stones, of course, that was an old approach to God, but he wanted stones in their original God shape. That's Amen. Right. So, and, and so we've got to find the way God approves Amen. of that. But my point was that's a kind of a movement meditation because they're constantly meditating on the names of God or the names they attribute to God. There's 99 names for God in the Islamic faith, and not one of them is Father. Not one of them is Father because and they don't believe that God can, as a father, actually enter into you where you can be born again. We, we have a friend that is um, actually 
was a Muslim at one point in time, and and that was the one thing that he kept mentioning was that there was no father picture in the Quran. It spoke of, uh, or uh, you know, God was basically telling Muhammad, you know, the Jews call me father, and and they they believe they're my children, but correct them. I'm not their father. I'm not their son. You're not my son. And that was just kind of an interesting like revelation, like what. You know, that's interesting that, that the, the love that we share with God is that, well, you know, what manner is this that they would call me a child of God? I don't deserve this, but yet that's how that relationship is framed within Christianity. And I, I loved God. I, I remember specifically sitting there cross-legged and meditating for hours, and then it would hit my heart, and I would break down weeping. Hmm. And I would say, God, I love you. I want to know you. Mm-hmm. How long is it going to be? Mm-hmm. I, I didn't know how easy it would be. Let me, let mm-hmm. me read out of my book yeah. In Search of the True Light. I, I just want to show you the heart of these Sufis that do movement meditation. Mm-hmm. This is their, one of their poets. Mm-hmm. They are noted for their Sufi love poems. They write poems to God. Mm-hmm. And what, what they think is God. Yeah, mm. what they think is God. And, uh, of course, in this poem is the name Allah, which I do not believe is the true God. Amen. I don't believe in Chrislam. I don't believe you can mix Christianity Amen. and Islam. But I want you to see the heart of people that are using these methods. Uh, he says, uh, and this is a Persian devotional poem by Abdallah al-Ansari, and he said, Thou whose breath is sweetest perfume to the spent and anguished heart, thy remembrance to thy lovers bringeth ease for every smart. Multitudes like Moses reeling cried to earth's remotest place, Give me sight, O Lord, they clamor, seeking to behold thy face. Multitudes no man hath numbered lovers and afflicted all, stumbling on the way of anguish, Allah, Allah, loudly call. And the fire of separation sears the heart and burns the breast. And their eyes are wet with weeping for a love that gives not rest. O God, all other men are drunk with wine. The wine bearer is my fever. Their drunkenness lasts but a night while mine abides forever. And of course, the analogy there is people get drunk with religion, but uh, he's totally enamored with the one who gives it. Hmm. But what gets to me is if they only knew that love was in a bodily form when Jesus walked the earth. Amen. And they don't have to dance mm-hmm. these swirling, whirling dances to try and achieve oneness with God. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord. That's right. Do you know, it, it, it's sad because, you know, I love, I love people. Because I was I was going to church every week, but I was worshiping another God the other six days a week. Mm-hmm. Didn't realize it. I called him Jesus, mm-hmm. but it was not the same Jesus as Paul said. Um, and this broke my heart because my wife, one of her best friends, uh, was raised in Turkey as a Muslim. And she found Christ. And when she gave her life to Christ, she said, I saw what I had, and she said, I came to this country, and she said, here in America, I heard people telling me that Allah and Jehovah or Yahweh are the same. She said, it's not the same God. Hmm. And she said, I can show you one place. She said, in the Quran, it says, Allah cannot have a son. Hmm. Right. The scripture says in 1 John, whoever denies the Father and the Son is Antichrist. Mm -hmm. She said so. And if you have not the Son, you have, you not, have the not the Father. And Christ said, no man comes to the Father except through me. Yeah, even when they were talking with Jesus and said, who, who is the Father? How do we know him? And he's like, yeah, I've been hanging out with you. Come on. <laughs> so, yeah, there's this very distinct relationship yeah. between Father so it's and like Son we, that you can't We have got around. to pray for, for you know, our, our brothers and sisters who don't even realize Satan is so subtle on how he tries to deceive people. Mm. But didn't you do movement meditation in we martial did. arts? Is this the kata? Is that what you're talking about? Like well, a, it can like be the kata, that... but um, Tai Chi is specifically mm. moving meditation. Mm. They, they tell you that's what it is. Mm. So in some of the kata that we did, and I'm sure Keith had done some too, each movement, like a, I remember the last grandmaster that I trained under, um, he, I'd been with him for a couple of years, and I came down to, to see him at his studio, and he said, you know, we're going to work on a new um, 
a new Qigong pose. And some of the Qigongs were stationary, you know, where you just meditated with your mind. Other Qigongs, you would go through certain movements and you do hold that pose for so many breaths and then you would go to the next movement. And he told me, I don't even remember the name of it now, but he told me this is the one we're going to be working on. And he started going through it and I was following him and it was like, I felt uncomfortable. I mean, I just felt uncomfortable. Like all the stuff I'd been doing, I should have been uncomfortable. But this one, it was like, I did not feel right. And I asked him, I said, uh, I said, see Joe, which means grandmaster or founder. I said, what is the name of this one? What does it mean? And he looked at me and he said, it means Iron Buddha. So each of the poses that I was doing, you'd hold this position or you'd hold this position and you'd breathe and you would concentrate. In each position, you would think and focus on this energy moving through the body. And with Tai Chi, it was much more subtle because what happens with Tai Chi, you teach them the motions. It's a dance. You do this and then you flow and you breathe and you get your breathing and your body to connect so that they're working uh, synergistically or harmoniously. And without knowing it, as the student gets to the point where they've got the movements memorized and then they've got the breathing in coordination with their movements, then you come to them and you go, okay, now this is what I want going on in your head. Because they can't be focusing on internal movement of energy when they're just trying to remember the the movements, but after they get those first two down, then you go to them and you say, this is what you're thinking. When that hand goes out, this is what's happening inside your body. So then they spend one year, two years, three years doing that, and you can get done doing one of those you know, forms or katas, and like you said, you feel like, man, I just had a shot of you know, super duper caffeine, I'm buzzing. And you, know, you can be drenched in sweat after you know, one form that might take you five minutes. Hmm. And so you What's did, the ultimate goal in Tai Chi? Is it uh, just the movement itself, or do they actually have a goal no, of attaining what, a level of consciousness? Um, at the highest level, again, you don't tell the beginners this. It's almost like Freemasonry. You know, they never are told the things that the guys at the 32nd or 33rd degree level are told. At the highest level, mm -hmm. it's immortality and Taoism. Mm -hmm. Tai Chi, which is a Taoist practice. The whole goal is to move and open up all those chakras to become enlightened. Crown chakra, third eye is open where you get supernatural ability to, to foresee. And then immortality. You become one with the universal energy. So has anybody ever achieved that? They, well, they, they claim. Yeah, they claim <laughs> I mean, that. like, I think everyone still dies, right? Well, no, but, but that's not it. You don't die. Interesting. You die. The flesh dies. You become you become part of the universe. Don't it's just they call like, them the immortals? Yeah, or ascended masters, or like in Star Wars, Obi-Wan, he died, right? And then later on, Luke, uh, Luke is sitting there talking to uh, Yoda, and Yoda says, oh, it was Qui-Gong, I'm sorry. Um, and and Obi-Wan did the same thing. He passes away into death, and then he comes back and communicates. Hmm which the Bible forbids. Yeah, which, which the devil obviously leaves that door open so that, you know, you think you're communicating with some ascended master. But, but the thing is, is even with that, they say they, they don't die, they just put off this flesh and they become universal. They become energy. They become God. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, we've got two more types of meditation. <laughs> uh, one is visualization. Number seven of the eight uh, different types is visualization meditation. Didn't you do that some? That was in Buddhism and in Taoism. Well, maybe because you, you should start off. Well, it's like what we've talked about. You would visualize... Um, oh, right, the flow of the energy. The flow of the energy. The way that I was first introduced to it was the first Grand Master I was under, and he, he told a group of us that were wanting to learn how to increase this energy within us, this chi. He said... This is what I want you to do. And don't anybody do this because if you if you do this and you're listening, you're opening the door to Satan and evil spirits to come into your life. I, I promise right. you, you don't have an option. This cannot be done without channeling evil spirits. But he told us, I want you to go into a room. You've got to be alone. It's got to be dark. Either have no windows or it's got to be nighttime. Black out all the, the windows so it's a dark room. 
you sit in lotus position and we would hold our hands, but we would hold these fingers. Mm -hmm. And you would hold these over your Which knees. Which has a little bit different meaning. Yes. You'd hold it over your knees and you would place a candle at a 45 degree angle in front of you on the floor. And you'd light that candle, pitch black room. And he said, you breathe internally, you're sucking in through the nose, breathing out through the mouth, connecting that governing and, and conception vessel, and you're focusing on the flame. And while you're focusing on that flame, you're to imagine and visualize yourself getting hotter. Man, it took forever. Hmm. I mean, it was like two years of doing that every single week. I mean, you know, and I had to wait till either my wife is asleep or, you know, I had to go somewhere where I was alone. Um, because I couldn't reveal to her what I was doing, she would have been like, Eric, this is of the devil. <laughs> I mean, like, she knows, and I'm like, no, 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 this is okay. When they tell you it's in the closet, black out the lights. And yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and <laughs> stare at a candle for hours at a time. But, you know, after two years of doing that, you're sitting there, and all of a sudden, you're, you're pouring sweat. And then it got to the point where, you know, he would put us out on the telephone pole that was horizontal up off the ground, you know, three or four feet off the ground, and you'd stand there in a horse stance, and I would just, I would see the candle in my head. And I'd be like, I'm hot. And then it got to the point to where you could do that in 30 seconds. Didn't even have to be, I could be inside running, and I'd be like, I think I need to be cold. And I would will it, what I was told, I was willing it to happen, and it would happen. But all that means is, is that Satan had come into me so much that when I said, I want this to happen, he did it. Hmm. And it, they make you think that you're the one controlling them, the genie that's right. in the bottle. Right. But you're really the vessel that the genie is in. Mm -hmm. And it's controlling you, not you controlling right. it. Mm. Yeah. So, again, may I repeat the statement that if a meditation technique is mechanical, mindless, monotonous, monotone, magical, manipulative, or even overly mystical like these, yes, it's not right. Amen. It's not relational. That's right. Because true meditation, <clears throat> in fact, uh, we'll get into this in the next uh, session, but true biblical meditation is much different. Uh, David <coughs> asked God that his meditation be acceptable in yes. his sight. Mm -hmm. So that implies to me that some meditation is unacceptable. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the final meditation will probably cover more in the next program or in the next uh, time of sharing, but it's silent meditation, which you've just described to a certain degree, staring at the candle. But also many uh, Christians, especially Catholics, following contemplative prayer methods, talk about entering the silence. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they always seem to refer to that scripture, be still and know that I am God. Mm -hmm. And in the next session, I'll explain. Okay. <laughs> I'll explain the depth of that. How that has absolutely nothing to do with meditation. Amen. Nothing to do with meditation, and yet the whole concept is you awaken yourself mystically and put yourself in a position where you can receive supernatural mystical experiences by just absolute silence. But that's not biblical meditation either. It there was a movie that was made on Ignatius Loyola, and um, I think in there there was a long period of time that the that the two that were part of this main story um, sat in silence. Yeah, days. And the voices that they began to hear and things. And I mean, I think about that in just a real, you know, outside of this, if you got put in solitary confinement for days, you can kind of go crazy. I mean, yeah. you start hearing things, stuff starts talking to you, and, you know, your mind, so... Uh, yeah, that's, that, that's interesting. I don't think it's wrong to still the mind. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when I'm praying and I'm meditating on a Bible passage, I don't just rush through it and right. read it. Right. I very slowly and prayerfully and worshipfully read it and mix it with worshipfulness toward God. But I'll pause and I'll listen. But if you're not careful, you can create by your own imagination what you think yeah. could be the voice of mm, God. So, and, and so you have to be very careful. Uh, God doesn't have to have 
a space of time to speak to you. In fact, mm -hmm. usually when God speaks to me, it's an interruption. Mm -hmm. He just Gone. bursts into my life at an unexpected time, speaks to me, especially in dreams. I'll wake up and hear his voice resonating in my heart. And so it's, it's a little manipulative, and there's that word, uh, to try and think that if I pause, then I'm listening to hear the voice of God. Like, okay, mm -hmm. it's your turn, God. You can talk now. Mm -hmm. That's manipulating and controlling mm -hmm. God. It doesn't work that way. But it does calm the mind and give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to speak revelation to your heart. So I don't want to make people scared mm -hmm. of being calm in God's presence. Right, right, right. But uh, you don't enter the silence in order to experience God. Mm -hmm. God is not this great void of emptiness. Mm -hmm. uh, God is a very personal God that wants relationship and communication. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. So there have so, been several, I think, Eastern disciplines where there have been monks or devotees who have vowed vows of silence, right? Right. Is that related to this? Oh, yeah. If you There's Buddhist retreats where I'll you'll spend that. a whole week where you don't mm -hmm. say anything. You'll eat in silence. You'll... Mm -hmm do everything in silence for so then, 10 days or 15 days or what have you. We also know in Christianity there were monks who took vows of silence, you know. And if you look at the Bible, God God never gives us this idea that we're just to remain silent for huge spans of time. Right. It says, you know, rejoice in the Lord, pray without ceasing. It tells us to praise the Lord. It, you know, it, we're, we're supposed to uplift our voices and communicate. Absolutely. And praise God and Amen. You know, not just remain in silence. I don't believe God wants people to, to live behind the walls of a monastery. Mm -hmm. Amen. When the Holy Spirit came in the upper room, Jesus foretold the happening and he said, you shall receive power mm -hmm. after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me. Right. Yeah. So the whole thrust was going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature, not retreating behind mm -hmm. walls yeah. and living in silence. When That's Jesus... not to diminish the passion that these people have who have done that. Yeah. What self-discipline it takes. to I, In fact, right after I got saved, I was on my way to a monastery. Having mm -hmm. been raised Catholic, I thought, well, I want to get closer to the Lord. Mm -hmm. I'm going to become a Catholic monk. Thank God God redirected my path because this guy picked me up hitchhiking that uh, held a knife to my neck and told me he was going to kill me. Mm -hmm. And I started preaching the gospel to him, and he ended up getting saved. But I said, God, I take this as a sign. I'm not <laughs> supposed to be a monk. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so you want, anyway. You, you want to share. When Jesus really gets a hold of your heart, it's like you can't keep quiet, you know? And that's the natural reaction is like, okay, I need to tell my family, I need to go tell my neighbors, you know, I need to just talk about this amazing thing that's happened to me. And you see that example in the Bible when, when God really transforms you know, people's lives. There's something that, that just came to my mind too. Like when you talk about the silence, especially since that's being brought into the church, which we're not going to get into that on this program, but on, on a future one. Um, the whole idea of silence, you know, if I'm, if I'm struggling with a problem in my family, you know, and I come to work or I come here to see you guys and I say, and they go, what's wrong, Eric? I mean, your countenance is showing something's wrong. And I go, well, this is what's happening. I'm getting advice. Mm -hmm. If I'm alone and I'm not allowing there to be a voice that I can physically hear, I'm, I'm turning inward. Mm. I'm looking inward. God never tells us to look inward and stay focused there. We're to look upward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when I look up and I stay focused on Christ, Here's the Word of God. Right. So by opening my mind here, if I shut everything down and I say I'm not going to speak, it, it, it turns me inward with an expectation that I'm going to hear something from inside. And mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that God doesn't speak to us, because He does. Mm -hmm. I'll be reading my, my Bible, mm -hmm. and sometimes God will be like, Eric, I'm talking to you right there. That's, mm -hmm. that's you. You need to do this or mm -hmm. fix this or stop doing this. Mm -hmm. But if that focus is inward and I'm like, I wonder if that was God speaking. Hmm. I wonder if that was just my conscience. I wonder mm -hmm. if it's just my imagination. I'm opening the door up for the devil to start whispering, which mm -hmm. he does good enough without us being silent. Mm -hmm. That opens a door up to for, for strong potential danger. Hmm. Well, also, and this kind of puts the cap on it, when Jesus 
was baptized in the River Jordan. The Holy Spirit came upon him, appearing in the form of a dove, and the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Amen. And he goes to the synagogue in Nazareth, and he did not say, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, for he has anointed me to become a monk and to live in the caves of the southern Judean desert. Amen. It was all about mingling with people and bringing change. Amen. Because four of the five things mentioned in Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, he quoted from Isaiah 61. Yes. For he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek, mm -hmm. to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty of, to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So four of the five things involve talking. Mm -hmm. Amen. But... To balance it out now, after he was uh, encountered, with, uh, after he had this encounter with the Father there at his baptism, he went into the wilderness for 40 days mm -hmm. of seeking God. And, and so seeking God is not wrong, mm -hmm. uh, but he came out with his main mission and his main purpose, and that was to bring change in people's lives. Mm -hmm. Like for me to, to, to isolate myself so that I can hear God's voice, there's an easy way to do that. Tell yourself, this week I'm not turning the television on. Mm -hmm. I'm not turning the radio on. I'm not going to do email. I'm not going to do texting. Mm -hmm. Then you've got time to spend mm -hmm. with no, God. I know why I can't reach you sometimes. <laughs> you, you, you bring a good point. We often will just quickly go to, well, I'm going to silence anything and then use that time with God, but we're not silencing these other voices throughout yeah. our lives and, you know, People will have no problem leaving the TV on all day in the background. Yeah. But it's like when you spend that time with God, you know. Well, we have spent a lot of time talking about what's wrong. Mm -hmm. On the next session, or in the next session, we're going to talk about what's right. And all the biblical exhortations to proper meditation. And I believe that's going to be really helpful, really yeah, important. I do too. I do too. Awesome. All right, well, that's been a broad survey of meditation in all kinds of other realms. And as you guys heard in a future program, we're going to talk about proper biblical meditation and what that looks like. So we hope you've enjoyed this episode and we hope you join us for the next one. This has been LED Live and we will see you next time. I love it. I mean, I can't watch enough of this. The duelist who they say can speak with the spirits. The sins will destroy the commandments forever. A suspicious list of names prompts an investigation at a local school and concern from parents. The death note is derived from a Japanese animated show. The girl told authorities she got the idea from a Cartoon Network show. Mom, it's Mr. Satan. I recognize that voice anywhere. our brothers at schoolforprofits.tv and watch from Babylon to America which has over 5 million views on YouTube alone and follow it up with America to Babylon. Check the description below for links to this.